And if that makes us more accessible, more palatable, more whatever, great. Because the more that the, the immigrant population gets understood, the more everyone realizes, cool, all of us have come from far away with these, you know, threads that connect us. Why are we so different? We are more the same than we are different. Exactly. We are. Absolutely. And if I have to, you know, make short eats the rest of my life to, you know, make a world that gets that, cool, I'm here for that. Hola y buenvenidos. Welcome to Mole Mama Cooking with Love. You're about to join us for our weekly adventure where we chat with entrepreneurs, chefs, and food bloggers who are helping us to connect, be inspired, and learn. We hope that you feel the same that we do. We are spreading love one bite at a time. And oh my goodness, given who our guest is today, I've researched this woman and now I'm like, oh, I need some street food now. So I have with me from Tuck Tuck Sri Lankan Bites, Sam Forrest here, and she is from Kentucky. And she was previously a web designer for high-end restaurants, and she was hosting traditional Sri Lankan brunches based on her mother's recipes in her home. And word of the meal spread around Lexington, Kentucky, and the guest, lo- the guest list soon outgrew her dining room. Surprise, surprise. She now teaches classes on both cooking and sociology of cuisine at the University of Kentucky. Kentucky. She has been featured on BuzzFeed and in local media. Tuck Tuck Sri Lankan Bites menus include four spin on Southern classics like slow cooked spare ribs and crispy fried chicken, as well as time tested recipes of sweet and savory curries. She was named one of the chefs to watch in 2018. And one of her quotes that I found from Plate Online, if I can make people understand the roots of where I'm from, that means the flavors I grew up with and love will have a chance to be out in the world, she says. Cooking makes me happy and brings other people joy. These are the flavors I grew up with at home and food from home is what resonates with people. Southern and Sri Lankan food are not the same animal, but they have a common thread of hospitality. When I was researching this woman, that just screamed to me of why I'm doing what I'm doing, because food is all about love and connection. So with that, welcome to Mole Mama, Sam. It is so great to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. That was a lovely introduction, A, and B, thank you so much for having me. It really does mean a lot. Well, I'm super excited. And like I said, I wish I had a plate of some of your food right here. (laughs) I get that a lot. (laughs) So so can you tell us, first of all, a little bit about Tuck Tuck Sri Lankan Bites? So I was cooking these brunches in my house. And all of a sudden, it very much grew to this point that I didn't really understand what was happening. And I think that's kind of been a common thread for the entire business is like, I have no idea what's happening. And it's a beautiful, wonderful thing because basically I just want to tell a story about, you know, the flavors. That's all I wanted. So I would invite people over for brunch and, you know, I'd invite nine or 10 people. And for the last one, which was in February 16, about 34 people showed up at my door with varying degrees of bottles of bubbly libations with them. (laughs) (laughs) And you sit there and you're like, well, I have enough food because I don't know how to cook small. And I think if you come from either a larger family or an immigrant family, that's kind of, you know, part of it is that, you know, we don't know how to cook small. We know how to cook for gatherings. And especially when you come to the States from thousands of miles away, even hundreds of miles away, if you will, if you come away from your home, a lot of your bonding, a lot of your cultural sort of identity is found through food. Absolutely. And just like you do not know how to cook small. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And so in thinking about that, and then thinking about how I let people get to know me, a lot of it, a lot of me is on the plate, to be honest, it's just one of those things that I think that food resonates so deeply with people, whether it's a comfort thing, whether it's a pushing boundaries thing, and which for Sri Lankan food and Americans, it really is. It's not like we're a very largely represented, you know, segment of culinary America. 
Um, I think there are a handful of Sri Lankan chefs in the States and I can probably count them on one hand. So when I think about stuff like that, when I want to bring the story of where I grew up and how I grew up, and especially of like the love that my mother put into her food, which is something that I only understood after I left home, I think that, you know, cooking for everyone just kind of made sense. Okay. So you had this last brunch at your home with 32 people, <laughs> or I think you said it was over 30 and they're, they're bribing you with bubblies. So what, I mean, what bribing me with bubbly does really work quite well. Okay. I just don't know how it got broadcasted to the entire neighborhood. <laughs> awesome. So I'm sitting, you know, in my house and people are bringing various and sundry bottles of bubbly along and, I've got all these people in my house and some of them are friends of friends, which is totally cool. But there was one instance where it was just someone I didn't know. And I'm sitting there lamenting to the bar that night. That it's just like, you know, this is getting to the point where it's people I don't know. And it's becoming costly because, you know, you feed 34 people when you don't expect to, and that kind of depletes whatever reserves you've got. <laughs> and so I was lamenting them and they couldn't get a food truck out the bars to save their lives in that neighborhood. And so they said that they would have to get paid. And for me, it doesn't make sense for someone to have to pay you when they have a captive drunk audience. It just doesn't because drunk people like to eat. And especially if you're serving, you know, simple food and they're like, well, what would it take to get you to do this? And I'm like, well, and I sat there and, you know, this is 2016. Everyone's got a smartphone. I started Googling and I did all the math and it was about $572 between food cost, setup fees, initial equipment buying, and a small $85 license plus a $50, you know, setup fee. And I sat there and I thought about it and it's like, typically people have to pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to even start a concept. And if I don't do this for 572 bucks, I'm not going to wonder what happened. So I thought that that was a worthy plunge to make. The first night we made over $750. And so I'm like, okay, this is a fluke, but <laughs> it's totally paid off. So let's just do it one more time. And I thought that I would do this twice and the bug would be out of my system. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I feel right. like spreading my wings here or there and, you know, I was just so like, you were bringing food to this bar then, you know, like a pop-up. Okay. I set up with some catering kitchens to get prep space. And I was just like, all right, we'll just make this a two month journey. And it's been over three years now. <laughs> that is an outstanding story. It's wild. I mean, and it's amazing how the word spread because it was such an organic, honest spread of, of what I was doing that I think it's given me a legitimacy that I really and truly enjoy. Um, people, people really are very open to being introduced to new foods. Well, and when they look like yours do. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of help with plating. I'm not going to lie. That's okay. The, the, the food still has to look a certain way. <laughs> a plate magician. It's still, still, so tell us how you came up with this name because it really is so cute oh thank you so i am a very firm proponent that anything that is worth discussing can be discussed over tacos so i have a habit of going to this little restaurant down the street they do two for one margaritas they do really simple tacos they make the tortillas in house like those are like little things i get very excited about so my husband and I are sitting with a pitcher of margaritas and I'm like, we need to find a name for this if we're going to do it. And he's just like, well, you know, what about Sri Lanka this or, you know, Island this or Serendib this. And I'm like, nah, everyone's kind of done that. And he's, he says, you know, what's the point of it? And I'm like, well, if it goes well here, maybe I can go somewhere else. And so you want this to be mobile. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't want to stay in one place. I, I did for a minute. And now I'm just like, you know, the story's got to be told beyond my initial limits. And he's just like, well, if you want it to be mobile, think of something that goes from spot to spot, but you don't want a truck. You want to be smaller than that. Right. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't want to do anything huge out of the bat. I was wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, what about Tuk Tuk? And I'm like, okay, I like this. 
I'm, I'm liking where this is going. He's just like, I took, took a small, it's mobile. It's got three wheels. You know, you can't have a huge operation running out of it. So you're kind of managing everyone's expectations, but you're nimble enough to go where you want. And I'm like, okay, tuk tuk. And I'm like, but if there's a ton of things called tuk tuk. And one of my friends were like, well, you're going to be serving small dishes. So just call them bites. And I'm like, no, we need to say a little bit more. And I feel like if people understand something about you from your name, that's a big hurdle. They're like, all right, tuk tuk. It's small. It's mobile. It might not be in the same place twice. And generally it's pretty quick. So that's kind of how it came about that. And a lot of margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> That is a great story. I love the name, and thank you for teaching me how to pronounce it. I didn't know. <laughs> it's actually my dad says tuk tuk. Okay, and so it's neither of them are wrong. It's just okay. some people call it a tuck and some people call it a tuk. It is very creative. <laughs> so, where did you learn to cook? So it says in, in your bio, you were, we were talking about you being a marketing person. Yeah, and now you're doing food. How did that happen? It's a very strange transition from like pumping people up to having to pump yourself up when you're used to pumping, pumping other people up. It's just a strange, strange, strange switch of gears for me. But I was always very into food and like my mother is an amazing cook. My mother makes all these amazing things from a homeland that I barely get to visit. And when I go to the homeland, my mom's dishes are better than theirs. And so I'm like, okay, you know, my mom is this amazing cook, but I'm going to college and I'm sick of Sri Lankan food. I want to learn everything else. You know, I want to learn how to make my own pasta. I want to know how to make the best French onion soup. I want to know how to make trout amandine because it sounds cool. You know, typical, typical 18, 19 year old mentality when the rest of the world is on fire and, you know, like this is 2001. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm going to connect with this side and you know, I'm going to learn how to make mac and cheese. <laughs> all these very lofty aspirations of cooking beyond a blue box. And I, and I was doing this and I was just like, man, I really miss my mom's food. I miss going home and having such a variety of vegetables and seasonal produce and, you know, even fruit on some occasions and amazing proteins that are cooked by a vegetarian who's not going to eat the meat anyways, but it's inexplicably one of the best curries you've ever had. And I'm like, yeah, I miss this. But my mom is not one of those people who willingly doles out recipes. And I think that's also kind of an immigrant thing. It's just like, all right, cool. I came halfway around the world and learned how to cook this with limited resources. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> and so I started kind of writing things down very slyly. And I started taking pictures of her as she cooked until I got a smarter phone and I took videos. And that's kind of where, once she figured out what I was doing, she's been very helpful. Because she's like, okay, this is your thing now. You need to understand what you're doing. But, you know, to get the right textures, the right consistency, the right amounts, like moms don't measure. Moms just know. And so, yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's exactly how my mother cooked. And I had to do similar things um, to learn her recipes. And now, one of the things that... Did you actually cook with your mother then when you were at home? Did you a bit. We were more, we were always in the kitchen and there were always things to do. But I was like a, in, in the terms of like a kitchen brigade, brigade, whatever have you, I was a very low level prep cook. <laughs> okay. It's not like I was getting to understand the method between the madnesses. It's just like, all right, cool. You're allowed to chop garlic now. You graduated from chopping onions. And I'm like, cool. This is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's basically that and hiding from doing a billion dishes because, again, my mom cooks for 40 without breaking a sweat. So everyone in the neighborhood, everyone in the diaspora is coming over to have dinner and get together and, you know, embrace who they are. And I'm doing the dishes. <laughs> My sister was better at the dishes, thank goodness. But I became fascinated, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And our mothers sound like they were a lot alike, like very much alike. Yeah. Um, as far as and she to wanted me to be a doctor, you know, she wanted me to be a doctor, a lawyer, a engineer something she didn't want me to be a, sh a cook she didn't want me to be a chef but now she's kind of 
amused by it and that she like neither of us understand what's happening, but we're both having a lot of fun with it. And she's just like, you don't need to talk about me. And I'm like, I don't think that people understand the level of influence that parental or familial or auntie cooking has on their perspective of food, their perspective of flavor. It's absolutely. And one of the things I always tell people is that make sure you videotape that home chef that you love because they might write down the recipe or you might try and sell it, but there's some little thing that they're doing someplace that they've done a thousand times. They don't even realize it. Mm-hmm. And that's the key to that recipe. So you need to have every move. just one Absolutely. Day. And now she kind of enjoys it because she's like, okay, we're going to make this come help me. And I'm like, okay, it took me 36 years to get to the side point in the kitchen, but <laughs> I'll <laughs> take it. That's lovely. She must be so proud of you. I, I, you know, I want to make her proud though. Our parents, especially, you know, my parents came over with a very, very small, like they came over with essentially nothing and they've built this life for us. And so, you know, the, the, I'm living the American dream, just a generation removed. That is so lovely. It's so lovely that you recognize that. (laughs) <laughs> it takes it takes a lot of falling down on your face to recognize the good things in your in life. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> okay, so I was looking at your website and I saw some terms that I'm like, oh, I know a couple of those are, but you you have some foods you call short eats. Short eats. Tell our a little bit about that. The drinking snack of Sri Lanka. Really? Oh my gosh, short eats are the best because you can go and you can pick up short eats or you can go to someone's house and be served short eats or you can grab them at a restaurant short eats are essentially the appetizer but more finger friendly it's not like you're going to throw out a spinach and artichoke dip it's got to be something that you can grab and you can eat somewhat quickly within a couple bites and you know turn it into this sort of drinking accompaniment Okay. Or company accompaniment, whether you're having them with tea, tea and savories, or you're having them with a gin and tonic or a beer, you know, drinking snacks. I think at their core, they're snacks. I mean, that's, and everybody loves snacks. Yes, we do. And then sometimes if they're fried snacks. Exactly. Oh <laughs> and it's just small enough that it's just like, okay, cool. I can be a little bit bad and have one of those. And it's, I mean, you know, honestly, none of it's that terrible. It's just like deep frying doesn't make things, you know, kale salads. It just makes them deep fried. <laughs> okay. So what are some of your favorite short eats? Oh man. Vade, uh, it's a lentil fritter. It's deceptively easy to make, but it's delicious and it's just like perfectly spicy inside. I make mine a little bit different, so they're a little bit fluffier inside. So you get some of that moisture from like being from the lentils and onions and it's like it's it's so deeply spiced from within that it's the perfect salty snack for for eating, drinking, you know, having at a happy hour. And then the cutlet which is honestly not that different from a Kentucky salmon croquette. It's, you know, Mm. fish and potatoes and spices rolled up and deep fried. It's a pretty good common ground. Okay. I'm not really sure why I asked you that because now I'm even worse. I'm hungrier. Yeah, now I'm hungry. Jeez. I don't, I barely eat my own food just because I'm around it so much. Now I'm just like, you know, a plate of cutlets would be pretty good right now. (laughs) But the, you know, with cutlets, you just walk by and you pop them. And I think I did a count one time of how many I ate. And I think I ate like 25, like as I was grazing and walking by. And I'm like, this is good. I'm going to have another. But uh, Sri Lankan food is full of these oddly composed bites that are all in one little package. And the more I started delving into the culinary industry, I started about 10 years ago in the culinary industry on the marketing side of things. Everything is kind of based on like having all these sensations in a bite, right? So Sri Lankan food to me is about creating your perfect bite, especially in a rice and curry situation. But if you can have a really great savory bite that hits all those notes that you want, you're great. Yeah. <laughs> We're both hungry now. I know. I'm, bu- I'm so hungry. 
<laughs> okay, I have to know. Are are you working on any cookbooks? Are you working on a cookbook? Kind of. <laughs> yeah, you can't talk about it. All right. I can I can talk about it. It's just a I, again, it's a lot of these things are just like things are, are falling into my lap because I'm I'm telling a story that I guess hasn't been told. Uh, and I want to do a cookbook and I, and I have a collaborator in mind actually, and we're working on ironing something out. And I, and I want to do a, a cookbook that is more than just like a stand up in your cook, uh, in your kitchen, a stand up in your kitchen and, and just look at it or have it on the shelf and it looks pretty. I want it to be a story. And I want people to understand the stories behind food. Mm -hmm. And I think that there needs to be a little bit more engagement on that level because when you understand the history, you understand what's on your plate, whether it's a personal history, whether it's a colonial history, when it, whether it's the history of the spice trade, you can infer so much from one plate. And so I want people to understand, like, I would honestly love to do a compilation book of a bunch of people who have those first generation stories to take before I do my own or combine them both. I don't know. I mean, it's, I think that there are so many stories that need to be told and, and food is such a great conduit for it, but I want my cookbook to be dirty. I want people to use it. <laughs> I have, I have a pretty impressive cookbook collection. I'm, I'm looking back at it right now and I have two shelves of them that are very pretty and two shelves of them that are just utterly beat up. And, and which ones can I not live without? It's the ones that are beat up and stained. That's so true. Yes, yeah, I can relate to that. So, so and I think that because I absolutely agree with you. My part of Molly Mama is every recipe tells a story, and um, and I think that when we understand those stories, we connect with the food, but then we can it allows us to connect with each other. And I think that's why everything's gone so crazy is because people are connecting with me on a level that I didn't expect. Right. Yeah. But that's maybe that's what people need right now, I guess. I mean, you look at the world and the world is on a million kinds of different fire, literal, figurative, whatever. And especially for, for immigrants and, and, you know, the children of them. And we're looking at the situation being like, okay, everybody is here to work hard. A lot of these things aren't true. How do I make myself resonate in a time where, honestly, you, if you look at it from an initial glance, it seems like it's a hostile environment. You look out at the world and you're saying, oh, well, everyone's against this, everyone's against that. But maybe if they find a way to relate, they're going to be a little less antagonistic, a little less ignorant, a little less you know, devoid of understanding whatsoever. And it's really, it's bringing something to the forefront. And I, I'm seeing this with a lot of pop-up chefs. Like we want to tell the story of our heritage. Mm -hmm. And if that makes us more accessible, more palatable, more whatever to a larger audience, great. Because the more that the, the immigrant population gets understood, the more everyone realizes, cool, all of us have done the same thing. All of us have come from far away with these, you know, threads that connect us. Why are we so different? We are more the same than we are different. Exactly. We are. Absolutely. And if I have to, you know, make short eats the rest of my life to, you know, make a world that gets that, cool, I'm here for that. That's outstanding. <laughs> I'm right there with you, sister. Absolutely. I can tell, and I like yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I've um, I've been very fortunate. I've traveled a lot with my day job, and I've right. been to so many different countries. And that that has been the most amazing thing to me is that we are definitely more than the same than we are different. And also, when you sit down and you share a meal with someone. There's like a connection that happens that Absolutely. is real. And if you put your phones down and you actually communicate, I mean, it's just amazing. And I think that that's one of the things that our current culture is craving. I think we are craving real connection. They're not craving on not on Facebook, but it's like a different real. kind of authenticity. Yes. It's 
it's not the authenticity of like, oh, well, I had this in a hole in the wall on the side street in Colombo. Like, no, that's that's not the authenticity I'm going for. The authenticity I'm going for is is honesty, honesty in telling a story, honesty in how I came about with a story. Like, take that deviled egg. You know, every southern picnic has a deviled egg, right? Yes. Every menu that is snout to tail has a deviled egg right now, right? I mean, it's the deviled egg is a pretty common conduit for egg yolks and various and sundry additives to that for the majority of the Southeast United States. I mean, everyone's got a deviled egg. So for me, I looked at the deviled egg and I was like, okay, I want to make a deviled egg. How do I make that deviled egg taste like one of my best food memories? And my mom used to make these egg curries to go with string hoppers, which are these little rice noodle pillow sort of things that are steamed and fluffy and delightful. And I was just like, okay, when I have string hoppers, which is one of my favorite Sri Lankan starches bases of a meal, what do I go for? Well, I always go for this coconut garlicky gravy and I always go for a piece of that egg and I always go for a little bit of the sweet, spicy onion sambal. And then I put it all into one bite and that's like my happy spot. So that's how I developed a deviled egg recipe is that I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to use that coconut garlicky gravy instead of mayonnaise. And I'm going to make that egg taste like the egg curry I had growing up. And I'm going to add that little spicy, sweet zip. And that's, that's what resonates with people. People love that. People get that. You know, they take one bite and they're like, okay, this is something familiar with a totally different spin on it. It's a translation. That is so beautiful. <laughs> I, I would like one, please. <laughs> or more than one. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I mean, I think I made, what, 300 or so in one, one event and they were flying so fast and they're like, okay, you're going to need 300 servings for a four hour event. I was out of food an hour and a half because it's just, it's such an easy bite to understand. It's approachable. So it sounds like what you're doing then Sam is you're taking family recipes like this heritage that you have, and then you're combining them and creating a whole other level. Trying to. I think I'm the only person doing that with Sri Lankan and Southern food. I hope I'm the only person I'm doing that with so Sri Lankan and fantastic. Southern food. Actually, you know, I don't hope that I'm the only person doing that with Sri Lankan and Southern food because every once in a while it would be nice to kick back and be like, okay, you do the cooking. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. is like I want people, to, selfishly, I want people to understand these flavors so I can get more of them. Oh, I love that. Okay. So what's your most popular recipe? Fried chicken. <laughs> That's where my heart lives. I'm, oh. I, I love fried chicken. Everyone's oh got a fried chicken too, when you think about it. Like every, like so many cultures have a riff on fried chicken. That's incredible. So I sat there and I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to make a fried chicken. And 90% of the time it's someone being like, wouldn't it be cool if you made a, a the first one was ribs. I didn't know how to cook ribs before I started cooking ribs on mass. You know, ribs aren't a staple of Sri Lankan culture. Sri Lankans don't really do tailgating or like, it's just not our thing. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I can make a rib. So I did the same thing with a fried chicken and with the ribs, I was selling, you know, 40 pounds a week on, you know, one pop-up. I could sell 40 pounds in a couple hours. And that's a, that's a lot of, that's a lot of food. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of food to lug around from prep kitchen to pop up. And oh gosh, I'm sitting here thinking about how many times I've completely set up a restaurant from scratch and then broken it down the same night. <laughs> but with a fried chicken, it was okay, cool. I want people to not be scared of the word curry because it evokes a lot of emotions. Oh. And I'm like, all right, cool. We're going to put every single thing that I put into a chicken curry into a fried into a southern fried chicken. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to, you know, use buttermilk because I think buttermilk is one of the best brining agents for meat possible. And, you know, this is all from years of experimentations with various and sundry techniques. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to use buttermilk and then I'm going to figure out a way to make the crust crispy for at least 15 minutes, which is one of the biggest challenges that I think I could have given myself. Because I, I was watching how long it took people to eat 
And I'm like, okay, it takes him about 15 minutes to finish a dish. I want every bite to feel crispy and wonderful and, and everything that it needs to be. And so it took me, I think, 18 tries on the right brine and seven or eight on the crust alone. And eventually it turned into something that's just a crazy flavorful bite of every flavor I could cram into a piece of chicken. <laughs> so if you're using all the spices in curry, is it spicy? Right? It can be. Oh. It's, it depends. It depends on my audience. I and mean, if I want to throw a couple serranos into the brine and add some cayenne to the rub, you know, maybe. But I, I go for more of those savory notes, those cumin, coriander, curry leaf notes. Those are the ones that I want to hit because those are the ones that, like some people crave spicy, but everyone will crave savory if it's the right bite. Mm. Are you hungry? Okay. Sounds amazing. <laughs> Okay, so what is your, so you're telling me what's your most popular, but what's your personal favorite? Ooh. You're cooking for Sam because this is what I love. What I, okay, hang on one second. So my pups are running around me and one decided that she was going to drum on the floor by scratching. Um, <laughs> it's okay. So my mom made this thing called the sick curry, which sounds terrible name alone, but it is my favorite comfort food in the entire world. I mean, I can eat bowls of it with rice, just bowls and bowls of it. And I finally, it took me forever to figure out the right ratio for me, but I finally figured out how to make it. So we moved recently into a new house and the first dinner I had over and my buddy, uh, my buddy Stella, she wrote a book called Brave Tart, The History of American Desserts. And she also happens to live in Lexington and is a very, very dear friend. And, you know, when you have friends that know and understand food on that level, having something so humble to hit every, you know, heartstring that you can think of is just that was our first meal together in this house is like when the first time we had friends over, we had a great bottle of champagne and this amazing like stewed chicken curry with vegetables and coconut milk and a little bit of you know turmeric and a ton of alliums. And it's just such a nice simmer dish. And it, it's just so warm and comforting and it just, it feels like eating a, like a, the essence of a warm hug. See? Like See, I want so that all the time. An invitation, <laughs> like I want to be invited to your house. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it does happen. A lot of people have come by the house for food. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> like even now, we don't publicize the brunches, but they do still happen. It's just it's writers and people who have heard about us, and you know, occasionally television hosts. And <laughs> That's fantastic. It's crazy. It's a fun. It's it's been a fun, fun, fun thing to share. But like when you have that sort of dish and I feel like, especially in Mexican food, you, you have like the pozoles and, and stuff along those lines. It's just like the warm comfort food. And my friend jokes that pozole is her love language and that's how happy and safe and warm it makes her feel. So this is, this is my, you know, happy, warm, safe bowl. Wow. Okay. So I have to know. Because I'm, you know, over the edge, completely starving. <laughs> what, what's always in your refrigerator? Like if I was going to come in right now and oh, man. You're in your refrigerator, go. Hmm, so this is the egg trick. Egg I have not been egg. home for a long time um, wow. because I've been traveling to for guest dinners and guest chef engagements. And so this is actually the first time in about a year that I've been home for longer than two weeks. So I am... Actually, right next to my refrigerator, I'm going to open it up and look. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I've always got green grapes of some sort. Um, okay. I've always got a really good, savory, punchy barbecue sauce. Um, let's see. I've got hot sauce. I've got a stupid amount of barbecue food. sauce, hot sauce. Parmesan cheese. Good Parmesan cheese. Um. I've got cashews, like raw cashews in my fridge in case I feel like mm. making cashew curry. I've got blue cheese olives for martinis. I've got berries and stuff. I've got a lot of cheese. <laughs> I love cheese. Oh my goodness. I grew up on a dairy farm. In oh. 
Yeah, yeah right. so my mom used to make homemade cheese. I, I am like a cheese. Oh my goodness. So, and right now, because I've been doing a lot of recipe development, I've got a couple of experiments in the fridge. And, so, you know, I keep the grapes in the fridge, I keep some apples in the fridge because I like the cold crisp. And I've got beer cheese, which is a very Kentucky thing. And, okay, well, thank you for sharing that with us. I'm usually, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious. It's like, what's, what's there? Beer cheese is mine. There's always cilantro, there's always avocados. Or See, something. those are two things that I can't eat, and it's very frustrating. <laughs> oh my goodness, I like you so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's like I'm the one. I'm the one on this side of the family, and my aunt, my late aunt, who taught me how to make that coconut garlic gravy, um, and I have this complete aversion to cilantro. And it's not the soap thing; mm -hmm. it tastes extremely metallic. And so I read this article about certain people do not have the taste buds for cilantro. Mm -hmm. We either like you love it or you don't. And it's, it's just because of your taste buds. But it's such a bum out because it looks so good on everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then avocados, you know, the only avocado delivery method I've had in Sri Lanka or among Sri Lankans has been the avocado milkshake. So I've never been a fan of avocados beyond that sort of pulverized texture because I just go for butter. So again, the Southern kid in me does rear its head every once in a while. Like I, I will go straight for better. <laughs> okay. I still like, yeah. <laughs> you can have my avocados and cilantro. I will uh, definitely yeah. give them to you. Yeah, like <laughs> but it's so weird because, you know, like I have all these very strange food aversions and yet everyone's like, oh my gosh, you know, we're very into the culinary world. I'm like, yeah, but I really hate certain things. <laughs> You know, I think it goes back to something you said earlier on. It's about being authentic. And if you don't like them and you have an aversion, you do. So that's oh okay. I'm, yeah. I'm very open about – it was funny because, like, I had this tomato pie recipe that went around the world and then some. And every – like, my friends are like, but you hate mayonnaise. And I'm like, I don't hate it when it's used as a tool. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want it on a sandwich. <laughs> like, Yeah. I'm, I'm very okay. vinegar oriented versus creamy oriented, I guess. Very interesting. Yeah. It's I a use a lot of vinegar in my marinades. I See, do a lot. Of it brings really so or... much flavor. Mm -hmm. And it especially does. I use a ton of lime juice. Me too. So I think that lime juice is like the most underrated acid ever. <laughs> Yeah, and people often go, I can use lemon, right? And I'm like, no, no, you need to use lime. It's very different. Yeah, and it's it's so, like, it depends on this part of the season and where you get the limes from. Like, some are sweeter and some are angry and sour and perfect. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> All right, so you have not been doing this for very long. You've no. had this amazing ride and trajectory. You've been on TV. You know, you've done all kinds of amazing things. What has been the biggest surprise since you started this journey? That people know who I am. <laughs> I'm like, I, I went to, I went to a big like event in Chicago last year and we were at a pre-party and someone's like, Oh, I've heard of you. And I'm like, how? Like I cook in Lexington. I'm cooking in the middle of Kentucky. And you know, but they're like, oh, well, so-and-so came and had food there. And then I saw this article. And I have been very fortunate to have a lot of people who are willing to be megaphones for me. And I'm going to be grateful for that every single day of my life. Let me tell you what. Whew. Like the level of, of love and kindness that people have shown and sharing what I do has been so overwhelming. Like, I never expected anything like this to happen. You know, if you're if you're sitting there like five years ago, if we were sitting there having a cup of tea or coffee or what have you, and you said, all right, cool, your recipe is going to be in a magazine. Like, even if it was the local magazine, it'd be like, yeah, sure. All right, go ahead. <laughs> so it's this it's this like almost curated disbelief that I have going. Um, I'm still kind of in shock about all of it because I haven't I haven't sat there and processed it all so to speak i'm just going you know in my head all of this has come out of nowhere what happens if it goes into nowhere <laughs> like i want to enjoy every second of it so i've been really focused on being present but when i meet somebody who's just like oh i've definitely heard of you and i'm like uh how <laughs> 
That is lovely. So beautiful. <laughs> it's so crazy. Lovely. I mean, it's a crazy, crazy life. I look at I look at the people that I've gotten to cook with, that I've gotten to meet, that I've gotten to cook for, and it's just crazy. Like a, a couple months ago, I filmed with Vivian Howard for her PBS show that's coming out this year. Um, I never expected to like create a great friendship out of that. Like she's awesome. I got to sit there and talk with her for like a couple hours about random things and found that we had some great common ground. People want culinary stories and I'm creating these amazing friendships. I've got friends that I absolutely adore that I've maybe only met a couple years ago and they, you know, they are my 5 a.m. soundboard because they understand both the immigrant story and then the food thing and how crazy it can be. And, you know, it's, it's amazing to have these people that share your path in a way that makes it an easier path to take. Very fantastic. And what a blessing. (laughs) Definitely. All right. So with all of this, what's been some of your biggest challenges? Uh, I have a hard time believing that what I'm putting out there is good enough. Um, and I think that that's a a hallmark of a lot of people that are in businesses that are kind of getting that rapid rise. Um, I've always kind of tried to keep foot on the ground. My mother has always told me like, no matter what happens in your life, be grateful, be humble, be kind. And, you know, I focus on that and I see all this and everyone's like, oh my gosh, isn't this great? And I'm like, "I, I don't think that I've done anything yet. And my husband and I continually talk about this because, you know, he, I have to have a sounding board and thankfully I have a huge cheerleader who also helps me out a ton when I'm setting stuff up and breaking stuff down and testing recipe ideas. Cause my palate's shot after, you know, half an hour of testing. So somebody's got to eat it all. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, for me to, I think the biggest challenge is kind of figuring out my place in it all. And figuring out how I feel about that and how to process that and how to turn that into something that is both fulfilling to me, but beneficial beyond to me. You know, you always want to leave somewhere better than when you found it. And so I have very radical ideas compared to certain folks in kitchens. Like I, all my helpers, I pay stupidly well because I think that they're my backbone. Some people in the restaurant industry are just like, okay, cool. Like only certain people should be paid this much and, you know. This, these folks get tipped and you there's a lot of structural things that I kind of rally against. And I also have kind of rallied against doing things any way of traditional, I guess. So now as I'm getting later into this, it's kind of coming up on the other side of it, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I've got a meowing kitty cat, but I, I, don't. I am surrounded by animals pretty much all the time if I'm not in the kitchen. So I joke, that like, it's it's cool. Like, I'd love to get to know you. I, I really want to hang out with your dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my little dog. I'm surprised she's not in here snoring. That's usually where she's at. I've got, I've got a mini Aussie that's trying to climb into my lap and a kitty cat that's looking out the window. Like, oh, I, wow. I want to I wanna get whatever's on the on the porch right now. <laughs> That's the beauty of Kentucky. I've got a menagerie of animals that I could not have in Boston. <laughs> That's really nice. <laughs> and I think what you just said about that being a challenge, believing in what you're doing. Yeah, I totally went off the rails. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I think that's so valuable. And I think it's so. Um, but I mean, you have those way, moments. I'm sure that you yeah. have those moments where. Oh, all the time. The, the voice of self doubt can be the loudest. Yeah. Unless you let everyone else drown it out. One of my guests recently, when I asked her this question, said that one of the biggest challenges is that she gets in her own way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I think that's kind of the same thing. It's like you have this disbelief and you, you know, that person in you steps up and goes, what are you doing? Who are you? What do you think you're doing? Well, I mean, either that or you try to do it all yourself. Yes. It's a lot. I mean, it's a lot. I'm starting to realize that because at the end of last year, I was just sitting there and I felt completely fried. I'm not going to lie. I felt completely fried because I'm just like, okay, you're going to do this. You're doing this. You're signing this. You're writing this. You're going here. You're doing that. You're also, you know, helping this out. And then I'm like, you know what? You need to chill for a second. 
Mm-hmm. And you need to figure out, A, what you're going to do, B, how you're going to do it, and then everything else can come up. Because otherwise, I don't want to get burned out on this journey. It's too much fun. Absolutely. So do you have any other words of wisdom for our listeners, for people that are pursuing maybe their passion or have fallen into something like you have or thinking about stepping into something that they've been Sometimes it's initially not the most lucrative. Um, I have a backup plan at all times. I like having a backup plan. (laughs) The fact that I have a backup plan is not an omission of failure. It's an omission of common sense and that, you know, what's the statistic? Like one in five restaurants will fail and, and, and be nimble. You know, I, my goal has changed a lot over the last couple of years. You know, this time last year, I thought I was going to be opening up a brick and mortar restaurant. This time this year, you would be hard pressed to find a way short of like hiring an entire staff and making sure I'm not responsible for it for me to even consider it. You know, there's so much that changes, especially now, especially with the internet, especially with all these channels of communications that you kind of got to keep yourself open. You, you got to be open to what the world is sending out. You got to be open to what you want to send out to the world. That is really lovely advice. <laughs> Thank you. So, Sam, it has been so fun to chat with you today. Thank you so much for having me. You're out of time. I want to make sure you tell our listeners how to follow you on Instagram and everything else. So, so everything, have- thankfully, Tuk Tuk Lex was not taken. So <laughs> <laughs> everything is at T-U-K-T-U-K-L-E-X.com or on Instagram or on Facebook or on Twitter. I will be announcing pop-ups around the country. Um, I've got some great stuff lined up this year that I'm kind of waiting to announce. So if you keep up with me there, um, it's I have a feeling that this is going to be a very fun year. And I want to, I want to embrace everything that it brings forward. So if that's going to take me all over the place, it's going to take me all over the place. And I want to meet people. I want to, I want to learn more stories, especially about immigrant cuisine. So. It's so beautiful. I sure hope that you're coming to California at some time. I was so lucky. It's It just hasn't been finalized yet. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again for tuning, for joining us on our podcast today. I'm so thrilled to be a part of it. And everyone I hope is subscribed. (laughs) I hope so. I'm going to be subscribed because now I have something to listen to that I know about and, you know, all those fun things. So thank you. All right. Thanks for having me. You need to shine your cooking bright ever so brightly. We need that light out there. (laughs) Thank you. I think I'm more loud than I am bright. So I'm just going to keep on being loud about the things that I like. It's good. (laughs) All right, everyone, please make sure you visit our YouTube channel where you can learn to make some delicious recipes that my mama taught me how to make like guacamole, chimichangas, mocajetes de queso, chorizo fundido, crunchy tacos, and so much more. And please private message us if you need any help making those recipes. We'd love to help you make them successful. Remember to add the most important ingredient to every recipe you make, your love. And as my mama always said to me as we said our goodbyes, que Dios te bendiga. May God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to Molly Mama Cooking with Love.